I'd like to give a brief overview to the methods of ab initio molecular dynamics. So, so far in this course, we've focused on the potential energy surface. We optimize structures for reactants, products, transition states, calculate energy differences between these, and infer things about the reaction rates and behaviors from those. But of course, all these analyses of the just the potential energy surface ignore the actual dynamics that occur under realistic conditions and at finite temperatures. For example, transition state theory makes all sorts of assumptions when computing the rate constant that can potentially differ from the actual reaction dynamics. Also, as the system becomes larger and more complex, it gets more degrees of freedom, the static potential energy picture of thinking about individual geometric configurations becomes less meaningful. If you think about a molecule surrounded by a whole bunch of solvent molecules, you can optimize that geometry, but chances are you're just going to go to some local minimum for some particular water arrangement. But there are going to be many possible ways you could rotate those waters, rearrange the hydrogen bonding network, and so on, that would all give very similar energies, and the energy barriers between these different configurations will often be quite small. So it doesn't make sense to talk about any one of those configurations. Instead, you need to sample a large number of them and do some sort of statistical ensemble averaging over the whole set of confirmations. So modeling the dynamics is the way to try to address these challenges, to treat the reactions more reliably in terms of the actual phenomena happening dynamically, and also as a way of sampling the appropriate and relevant configurations at a given temperature. For example, the ones that are accessible at room temperature. Now, the correct approach to modeling dynamics would involve solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So what we would do, for example, is we might solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation at many geometries and map out the potential energy surface. So we'll have energy versus the nuclear coordinates. Now that's an uncomfortable or awkward form to work with, so we're probably going to then fit that potential energy surface to some analytical functional form. And then once we have that functional form, we can plug that in as the potential in our Hamiltonian in the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And we can go ahead and solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation to understand how the wave function propagates in time. Unfortunately, while this is the right way to do it, it's just not practical for systems of any size. You can really only do this fully for systems with a handful of atoms. You can play various tricks to try to do this in larger systems where, for example, you might only treat a select number of degrees of freedoms fully quantum mechanically, and maybe treat some of the other ones classically, but it's still going to be expensive. So this isn't done very often. Molecular dynamics is the far more common and more practical approach. The idea behind molecular dynamics at least ab initio molecular dynamics, is that the electrons have to be treated quantum mechanically because they're very light particles and they really do have strong quantum mechanical behaviors. But nuclei are much heavier, something like a thousand times heavier, and they can actually be approximately modeled pretty well as classical particles. Now this does neglect things like tunneling, uh, zero point vibrational energy, etc. And the biggest errors will likely handle, occur for hydrogen atoms um, because those are the lightest nuclei, and they also therefore undergo the most tunneling and so on. But still, molecular dynamics can be pretty effective. And so in molecular dynamics, because we're treating the nuclei classically, we're going to propagate them via Newton's law, F equals ma, or the derivative of the energy with respect to the nuclear positions is equal mass times the acceleration, which is the second derivative of position with respect to time. So in other words, the same gradients of the energy that we use when optimizing the geometries in our quantum chemistry calculations can also be used as the forces that move the nuclei in time. I should also mention that here while I'm talking about ab initio molecular dynamics in which we do the quantum treatment of the electrons, solve the electronic Schrodinger equation, the idea of how you propagate the nuclei is exactly the same as what happens in classical molecular dynamics with force fields that we talked about in a previous lecture. Those classical nuclei don't, we, in that case we use the force fields to treat the electrons and the behaviors of the bonds and angles and so on, but the propagation in time occurs according to Newton's law, just like I, we're talking about here. To give you a little bit of a sense of how this works, I just want to show you the Verlet algorithm for how we propagate the nuclei.
So consider that we have the particles at some position ri at team ti at time ti, and then we can ask, well, where will those particles be some delta t time later at time ti plus one? So delta t is the time step we're using to increment from ti to ti plus one. To figure this out, we're going to use a Taylor series expansion that represents the coordinates at the new time ri plus one in terms of the old time coordinates ri plus a series of correction terms that depend on the first derivative of the positions with respect to time, the second derivative with respect to time, and the third derivative with respect to time, etc., multiplied by increasing powers of the change in time, or delta t. And so if you look at this first equation and then simplify, you can realize that this looks like the coordinate positions at the new time look like the coordinate positions at the old time, plus the velocity those particles are moving at times delta t, plus one half the acceleration of those particles times delta t squared, plus one sixth the hyperacceleration of those particles times delta t cubed, etc. Now, this is a nice equation, but it's a little bit convoluted to have to evaluate all these things, and it, it is potentially numerically noisy in doing so, but we could also consider propagating backwards in time to go from ri to ri minus one with a time step of negative delta t. And if we do this, we're going to get the exact same expression, except the terms with the odd powers of delta t are going to come in with a negative sign instead of a positive sign. So we get ri minus 1 is equal to ri minus the velocity times delta t plus 1 half the acceleration times delta t squared minus 1 sixth the hyperacceleration times delta t cubed, etc. If we add these two equations, we're going to get some cancellation between the terms with odd powers of delta t. And so in the end, when we add those, we get ri plus 1 plus ri minus 1 is equal to 2 times ri plus the acceleration times delta t squared plus higher order terms that are going to involve delta t to the fourth, delta t to the sixth, etc. If we rearrange and solve for the coordinates at ri plus 1, we get that's equal to 2 ri minus ri minus 1 plus the acceleration times delta t squared plus higher order terms. So in other words, we're expressing the new particle positions at ri plus 1 in terms of the positions they've had at previous time steps and their accelerations. And so this is our approximation, and of course the accelerations we saw we can get from Newton's law, where it's just f equals ma, and f is equal to the derivative of the energy with respect to nuclear positions, and so we can solve for the accelerations, and it's just one over, negative 1 over the mass times the gradient of the energy with respect to nuclear positions. And this allows us then to map out a trajectory for how those positions change due to forces coming from the incremental time steps of delta t. And so in particular we'll have some initial coordinates and then we can propagate in time based on what the accelerations we calculate from the forces and then generate our new coordinates, and we keep doing this in increments of delta t until we mapped out the time evolution. The advantage of this Verlet algorithm compared to the simpler equations I showed with the first Taylor series expansion is that it's accurate um, to delta t to the fourth power um, because the, the delta t to the third power cancels, and so this means that we get less numerical noise. In the limit of delta t going to zero, then this would become an exact integration of Newton's laws, but in practice we'll have a finite delta t, and so this is going to have some error. Now, in actuality, people don't usually use the Verlet algorithm and these days. They use some, a variant called the velocity Verlet, which has slightly better numerical properties, but it, the ideas are somewhat similar to this. Now the key when doing molecular dynamics is your time step. The size of that time step delta t is crucial. It needs to be small enough to describe the timescales of interest. Molecules rotate and vibrate on timescales of anywhere from, say, 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 14 seconds. You can see that by just taking the sort of typical vibrational frequencies, so for example, a 3,000 wave number CH stretch, and converting that to hertz. And you'll find that it corresponds to something like one vibration taking 10 to the minus 14 seconds. So if we want to model the dynamics of these particles and capture all these dynamics appropriately, we need to use something like femtosecond time steps or smaller to describe those motions so that we can be sure we have a our trajectory includes 
the stretching and compressing of each one of those CH bonds or whatever. But if you think about this, chemical processes typically occur, if we're lucky, on the order of picoseconds, but it can be as long as microseconds, seconds, or more. And so if we're taking one femtosecond time steps and we're trying to simulate one microsecond of time in our chemical system, we're going to need 10 to the ninth or one billion time steps just to reach that one microsecond of simulation time. And even worse, if we want to get good statistics, we're usually starting from some randomized initial position or some initial positions and randomized velocities. We're going to want to average over a bunch of different possible initial conditions in order to make sure that we're getting good statistics. And so we may need to do many billions worth of time steps to do that microsecond of simulation time with good statistical accuracy. So obviously you have to do some balance between the accuracy with which you integrate your equations, in other words, how big of a time step we take, and how long of a time scale you want to simulate. Now you can use coarse graining of some form to try to help average over the less important degrees of freedom. For example, if you don't really care about the CH vibrations, you might do some sort of model that perhaps freezes the CH vibrations or does some other sort of techniques to try to ignore those so you can do faster time scales. But in general, this is a fundamental limitation. It's going to limit how much we can actually simulate. Now once we have these sorts of things, there's a few ways we can actually perform the dynamics. So one way you might do it is you might go back to the sort of way we thought about solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. That is, we'd compute the potential energy surface in advance, try to map out all the regions that we think our particles might want to explore, and then fit that to some functional form. And now that we have a functional form, we can calculate forces of that functional form easily, right? We can do an analytic derivative of that functional form, and now we can just plug in coordinates to get what the forces are and then do our dynamics. So that allows us to do cheap dynamics and you can then do something like microseconds of simulation time, possibly more. The real hard work in this case is up, done up front. It's building and fitting that many dimensional potential energy surface. As your system gets bigger and more complicated, you just have more dimensions that you need to map out and it becomes extremely difficult to try to do that all a priori. And in, you may also have to identify just what are the key regions of the potential energy surface that are relevant. And if you make a mistake, that could mess up your dynamics. So this is a way to do long time simulations, but with the caveat of you've got to do a good job of building your potential energy surface beforehand. If you don't want to do that, the next option is Born-Oppenheimer MD. And so this is a situation where you evaluate the energies and forces on the fly. So at each time step, we're going to solve, for example, the DFT equations to get the energy, and we're going to compute the forces. So it'll be like the equivalent to one geometry optimization step in the sorts of calculations you've already done. And then we're going to use those energy and forces to propagate a single time step in the future. Then we're going to repeat that process over and over for each new time step. So every time step, we're going to calculate the energy, so basically solve DFT, and calculate the gradient of the DFT energy. The advantage of this is that we don't need to know anything about where this reaction is going to go on the potential energy surface beforehand. We can let the dynamics figure that out and it will always be able to calculate the energy and forces on the fly. On the other hand, each time step is relatively expensive. We need to do a single DFT energy and force calculation. And so, you know, if you were going to try to do a microsecond simulation like we talked about with one femtosecond time step, that would be a billion steps or a billion DFT energy and force calculations. That's just not going to be feasible. In practice, um, the tr step sizes with ab initio molecular dynamics are often smaller, something like a quarter femtosecond, and it, you're it's very rare that you can simulate beyond maybe a few picoseconds of simulation time with ab initio, with Born-Oppenheimer MD. The third strategy I want to mention is carr parnell MD. So this is somewhat like BOMD in the sense that you're doing all the calculations on the fly, but the key idea here is that you're actually going to evolve the ele electronic orbitals and the nuclei simultaneously. So instead of solving the DFT equations at each step like you do in BOMD, you just do one SCF or self-consistent cycle that's part of solving the DFT equations and then calculate the forces directly. Now that won't be perfect because you haven't solved the equations self-consistently, so the forces won't quite be right, 
But what you're going to do is you're going to sort of maybe in that initial step you do solve it all the way to self-consistency to get a reasonable initial forces but then you're going to allow the dynamics to nav to propagate not only the nuclei in time but also the orbitals in time and so to do that you have to give the orbitals some sort of fictitious mass um, it's not physical but it works mathematically and this allows your orbitals to sort of keep evolving in the way they hopefully would if you were doing the full BOMD it's a slightly strange process, but there's a couple limits that may help give a little intuition for this. If, for example, the nuclei had zero kinetic energy, Carpomel molecular dynamics would just be a different way of trying to solve the SCF equations, evolving the orbitals towards the SCF solution. So instead of doing the normal iterative SCF that we talked about earlier, you'd be doing this sort of dynamic solution to evolve the orbitals down to the lowest energy state. Another limit would be if we were doing this CPMD and we slowly reduced the kinetic energy from both the nuclei and the orbitals, it would actually push the orbitals towards the Born-Oppenheimer solution, the SCF solution, and the optimized geometry as well, and it would do both at the same time. So it would sort of be like solving the DFT equations and optimizing the geometry simultaneously. Now the biggest challenge here is with the fictitious masses. The smaller fictitious masses you use, the closer your results will be to Born-Oppenheimer molecular dynamics, which is of course a more true dynamics. Um, but then also the smaller fictitious masses you use, the smaller your time steps will be. So just to compare these two approaches, CPMD is generally faster than BOMD because it's only requiring one SCF cycle per time step rather than several in BOMD. Now you can do things like Fock matrix extrapolation that try to extrapolate the converged Fock matrix at the new time step based on the Fock matrices from previous time steps. And so you can get your self-consistent BOMD calculations to require only a handful of SCF cycles, maybe four or five or six per time step. So that makes it a little more competitive with CPMD, but it's still going to be more expensive. CPMD also potentially has better error cancellation. One problem with BOMD is that based on the variational principle, when we're converging our SCF equations at each time step, we're always coming in from above. And we're always going to make some finite error because we never converge the results to infinite precision. We converge them to some finite precision. And if you're too loose in that finite precision because you're trying to make your calculation fast, you're always going to have systematic errors at each time step where your energy is going to be a little too high. And so that can actually lead to energy drift, which I which means that your energy is no longer conserved in your dynamics and so that's a problem. So you have to converge your SCF equations tightly enough in BOMD to make sure you don't have energy drift and conserve energy. CPMD doesn't have that problem because it's, gonna, it's going to have errors too but they're going to be more random, sometimes above, sometimes below, so hopefully you can have less systematic error and therefore less energy drift. Finally, while those are great strengths of CPMD, you do have to be careful with the fictitious masses in CPMD. If you choose those poorly, that can actually lead to larger errors and therefore incorrect dynamics. And by fictitious masses, again, I mean the masses that you're ascribing to these orbitals. And that, so it can take some experience and intuition to figure out the appropriate masses to give those. And most of the time, things are fine, but occasionally you can find examples where the results were nonsensical and it can be tracked back down to a poor choice of the fictitious mass. Overall, all three molecular dynamics approaches described here have their uses. It really just depends on what types of questions you're trying to answer and how viable it is to, for example, pre-compute the potential energy surface or whether you'd rather do it on the fly, whether you can afford Born-Oppenheimer, or do you'd rather do the shortcuts with CPMD, etc.